Howdy, people. Hope this finds you well and working hard and, uh, yeah, basically doing everything that uh, you should be doing and told to do, being safe. I was... Um, I went to Asda earlier on today and there was a big snaky queue of people just kind of like two meters apart. It all worked very, very well. Um, but I still don't understand why there's still no toilet roll or anything on the shelves. Why people, are we eating more food? Do we need to use more toilet roll than we normally do because of this? No, it's just a bit silly really, isn't it? There's plenty of food for everybody and yeah, there you go. What happened in a live one? I don't know. So it just got cut off. I'm not entirely sure why. Okay. Uh, really importantly, we're not to mention the name of the virus. Okay. In the chat or anything like that. It seems YouTube's flagging content that has that at the moment. So let's not use that, please, guys. Um, so yeah, I know it's ridiculous, isn't it? Right. Let's just crack on because we got cut off yesterday. But I got cut down in my prime yesterday when we were talking about Gibbs free. Of, uh, gives free energy okay so um let's carry on i want to discuss with you the qualitative nature of the the delta g equation okay yeah yesterday they did all the live stream servers just went kaput yesterday um and uh, yeah cut me off damn it damn you youtube um right so i'm going to share my screen and we're going to carry on where we left off yesterday, if that's okay with you guys. So we're looking at Delta G. I've obviously penciled today in to do questions more than anything else. So I, I'm going to see if we can squeeze a couple in at the end. But I think it's important we cover the content before anything else, okay? So um, we have got Delta G equals Delta H minus T Delta S. Now, as we said yesterday, that this Delta H um, is in kilojoules per mole. T is in Kelvin. Delta S is in um, joules per mole per Kelvin, okay? So what we need to uh, do is make sure that we understand how this equation works qualitatively, okay? Really, really important. So if we've got delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Now, for a reaction to be feasible, in other words, AKA spontaneous, AKA will the reaction happen? That's what feasible means. For a reaction to be feasible, and for us to say that we think it's gonna be feasible or spontaneous, then delta G needs to be zero or below, okay? So zero or below. Now to achieve that, obviously the sum, this sum here needs to be either zero or a negative number, okay? Now, how do we guarantee ourselves that this is a negative number? Well, let's do this in red. If our delta H is already negative, okay, and our delta S is positive. Now, T is always positive, okay? I'll just get this out of the way. T is always positive because it's in Kelvin, okay? You can't get lower than zero Kelvin, so it's always going to be positive. Now, if you've got a negative delta H and you're uh, subtracting a positive number, therefore, delta G is always going to be negative, okay? So always feasible at any temperature, okay? So that's really, really important that you know that, okay? So yeah, so what we're looking for is an exothermic reaction and an increase in entropy for that reaction that's always going to be feasible. What happens if... Oh, poo. Undo. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Let me write that again. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Now, what will these be if there's a reaction that is not feasible at any temperature? Don't worry, I'm going to straighten this out now for you, the diary, okay? So for delta G to always be positive, if we take a positive number, so a positive delta H, so we've got an endothermic reaction, and we take away a negative number, so in other words, a decrease in entropy, this is never feasible. at 
any temperature. Okay, does that make sense? So this basically, so in other words, always a negative delta G. This is always a positive delta G. Now I've seen questions ask you this, okay? So why is it, you know, use the equation to explain why it's feasible at any temperature. Use the equation to explain why it's never feasible at any temperature, okay? But doesn't plus and minus make a minus? Well, let's say we start with um, a positive number and we're taking away, okay? This is always positive, all right? If we take away a negative number, that means we're adding it, okay? So it's minus, minus two. So if we started with 10, minus, minus two, that's 12, right? So as long as this delta S is minus, then it can never get to zero, okay? It can never get below zero. Yeah. Yeah, with me? Boom. Okay. Now, there are two other ways of thinking about this. Okay. There are two other ways of thinking about this. The third way, let's do a line under there. So that's where we've got a positive, uh, uh, sorry, a minus and a minus and a, and a plus and a minus. Okay. Mind blown. Good. We like that. That's what we're here for to make hopefully mind blown in a good way. Right. That's like, oh, I get that now. Is that easy? Whoa, that's a good question. So for reactions like that, can they still occur if, uh, like after, uh, if you alter the temperature and pressure and throw in a catalyst? Um, no, okay, because pressure is not gonna change whether the reaction is gonna uh, happen or not. In these instances, okay, as I said, the first one is feasible at any temperature above zero Kelvin. The other one is never feasible at any temperature. So no change in temperature is gonna affect it. Okay, so pressure is not going to affect anything in there. A catalyst got nothing to do with it. Okay, it doesn't affect delta H. It doesn't affect entropy. So changing those things will not change that fact. Okay, so what are our other combinations? Let's think of combinations. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Um, what if both of them are positive? Okay, so don't forget for any reaction, delta H is a set thing. Okay, the entropy of, entropy of reaction is the entropy of reaction. Delta S is a set thing. Change in entropy is a change of entropy. Okay. Yeah, 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 Edith, don't you worry. I'm all over that. Okay. So if we start with a positive number and we're taking away a positive number. Okay. So let's say that delta H in this case was 100. Okay. The temperature is, uh, I don't know. Well, actually, no, let's do this. Um, 20. Okay. So if we start with um, delta H is 100, delta S is 20. I'm just picking numbers out of, my, out of the air here. Okay. Now, what's going to happen? Well, we're starting with a positive number and we're taking away a positive number. Right now, if temperature was, I don't know, um, two, just picking easy numbers here now, if temperature was two, 100 minus two times 20, is it feasible at that temperature of two? It's 40, isn't it? So the answer here is plus 60, okay? So the answer for delta G here is, uh, delta G here is plus 60. What if I change that to a three? still not feasible. What number does it need to get to before it starts becoming feasible, guys? Uh, what number do I need to put in T to make it feasible? Yeah, ag agile, agile, agile. Delta, delta H does need to be smaller than T delta S. So it needs to be five, absolutely. So what we're seeing is here that in the grand scheme of things, so this is temperature and this is delta G, over time, uh, over time, as we change, um, oh, hello. Where did that come from? Um, as we change temperature, what's happening to the value for delta G? As temperature increases, what happens to delta G? Do -do -do. Decreases, good. So we're looking at this, aren't we? Okay. And at this point here, let's say this is zero. Um, it's at this point here. What can we say? It's at 
um, at a um, certain temperature, the reaction becomes feasible. Okay, so when you've got two positives, you've got a, an endothermic reaction, but an increase in entropy. When you increase temperature, you're moving towards the fact that it will become feasible at a particular point. Yeah, so a feasibility point, absolutely. So what do you think it's going to look like if I write delta G like so? This is negative and this is negative. What is um, this going to look like? That's my question to you. Good. It's a positive correlation line. It's the other way around. Okay. So what we can say is that um, at a particular point, okay, if this is zero, so at a certain temperature, the reaction um, is no longer feasible. Okay, so having this in your mind when you're answering these types of questions is really, really important. Okay, so knowing these combinations of exo and endo and increase in entropy, decrease in entropy, you know, there's only these four combinations. Okay, so um, all we need to think about, I think these in particular down here, okay, you need to be careful with your wording. Okay, so when they ask you, what happens at this point for this graph, you need to say it becomes feasible at a certain temperature. Okay, so as if you're going up through the temperatures and all of a sudden, oh, it becomes feasible now at this temperature. Whereas with this one at the bottom, as you go up through the temperatures, you get to a certain point where it's no longer feasible. Okay, so just having this knowledge is really important when you do questions on these. Okay, does that make sense? Delta H is the y-intercept. Uh, no, not for this one. Not for this one. It's a different graph. Or is it a different graph? Oh, we'll get to that in a sec. So anyway, uh, somebody was asking, I can't remember who it was. How do we find the temperature at which um, a reaction becomes feasible? Well, temperature equals delta H over delta S, okay, that's it, done. That's all you need to do, just remember that. It's in your cheat sheet, okay? So uh, T equals delta H over delta S, okay? That's all it is. Um, one thing you have to be aware of, what do you have to be wary of whenever you're doing any iteration of this um, this equation? What, do you, what have you got to pay attention to? Otherwise, you're gonna get the wrong answer. Boom, Edith, absolutely, units, yeah, good. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you, um, you can times that by a thousand because it's usually in kilojoules per mole, or you can divide this by a thousand to get it in kilojoules. It's up to you, okay? So it doesn't matter what you do. You can either times the delta H by a thousand or divide the delta S by a thousand. Just do one of them, okay? And you're gonna get your answer, okay? And that's it. Joules per Kelvin per mole is delta S, yeah. OK, so um, having this qualitative understanding really, really helps, I find, get, you know, having this understanding of this equation rather than like, oh, I remember the equation. I'll just plug numbers into it. They go deeper and they ask you questions. This is how you get the top grades is by knowing, being able to explain what happens when temperatures increased and so on and so forth. OK, and it cut out, did it? It's a bit weird. OK, so let's talk about the graph, shall we? because we can have this rearrangement of um, this equation to give us uh, delta G equals minus S T plus delta H. You can't hear you, you can't hear me. That's no good, is it? Let me just change the mic. Uh, more audio, audio. Can you all hear me okay? 
I think we're okay, aren't we? I'm still moving. Okay. So this is a different iteration of this um, uh, of this equation. All right. So that there. Now this is basically a y equals m x plus c graph. Okay. So of course, what we have, as we were just talking about a minute ago, actually. So on the y axis, this is delta g. So it is the same graph. I apologise to whoever uh, mentioned that before, and I put you down. Um, and of course, this is temperature here. Now. When you've got um, this type of graph, so let's say you've got uh, this one here. So the gradient equals minus delta S. So if you had this graph, yeah, when you're given a graph, absolutely when you're given a graph. So the gradient equals your minus delta S, okay? So you're gonna have a negative gradient which equals your minus delta S. So having this negative gradient, what does that tell you about the entropy change for the reaction? Is it positive or negative? What's the entropy change for this reaction? Is it positive or negative? Negative? Oh, same positive. becoming less disordered there's another way of putting it negative we've got a real mix here haven't we so we've got a negative gradient let's say the gradient was minus 10 so that means minus 10 equals uh minus delta s so that means the delta s is positive there's an increase in disorder okay now just going back to what we said here is that there? See how we've got this negative gradient? And that's because delta S was positive, okay? So it's because the minus S is there, isn't it? Okay. Oh, Jazz, I'm sorry it wasn't working for you. You with me? So if you see a negative gradient, that means your delta S is positive, okay? Obviously, if you see a positive gradient, that means delta S is negative. All right. So just be careful with that. Just be careful. So what we're saying here is that if you've got a negative gradient, so if the gradient is minus 10, that equals your minus delta S. So therefore, 10 would be delta S, which is a positive number. Yeah. So two, min two negatives equals a positive. That's what it is, okay? And like I said, it links directly back to what we just said here, where you've got a positive delta S and you've got this uh, negative correlation here. When you've got a negative delta S, you get a positive correlation, okay? That's the reason why. It all links together, guys. All links together. Um, as we mentioned before as well, um, so M is your gradient. We've dealt with that. C is your Y-intercept, and that will be your delta H for the reaction. Okay, so if you were asked to find the delta H using this data, uh, using a graph, you could easily do that. Okay, easily do that. Any questions on that? Uh, the X is, is temperature. So that's basically the X axis here and the Y axis. Okay, so any other questions on this, guys, before we move on? Yeah, absolutely. The graph can go the other way for sure, okay? For sure. It depends on your delta S, doesn't it? Okay, it depends on your delta S. Any other takers? Yeah, so the gradient equals minus delta S. Yeah, the gradient equals minus delta S. So when you've got um, a, a positive correlation, the gradient still equals minus delta S. So this time your gradient is positive. Okay, so that means that delta S is negative. 
Okay. All good? Excellent. I'm pleased you get it. I'm pleased you get it. So in terms of thermodynamics and entropy, I mean, this is as, as, as complex as they can get. Okay. Um, let's have a look at a question. Let's, let's, let's go crazy. Let's do a question. Um, da, 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 da. Let's, since we've been talking about the graph, let's do this. Okay. So this is a classic question, this one. Yes, Miss C. Yeah. So they're like, think of them as inverse of each other. So if you see a positive correlation for this delta GT um, uh, graph, that means your delta S is actually negative. Okay. So there's a decrease in entropy. Whereas if you see it going down, that means there's an increase in entropy. It's because of the minus delta S part of the equation. Okay. That's what does it for you. It flips it. So this question is about free energy changes, enthalpy changes, delta H and temperature. Gibbs equation given below. Chemist investigates the reaction to determine how delta G varies with temperature. The results are shown below. So straight away, guys, without even from what we've just learned, what does that tell you? Firstly, without actually, let's do this question just in parts. So the question here is, what's significant about the gradient in the line values P and Q shown in the results? Explain your reasoning. So what's P? What does that tell us about the... Um, about what does that tell us about the reaction? What's P tell us about the reaction? Be specific, be specific. P is delta H, yes, but let's be specific. Delta H is negative, good. All right, that's all I was after. So we're being specific about P here right now, okay? We're all kind of running off doing different things. Let's just focus on one thing. So P, it basically tells us that the reaction, the delta H is a negative value because of where it is, okay? So it's definitely a negative value. Uh, what does that tell us about the reaction? Let's make that final leap then because of course we're answering this question. So delta H is negative, therefore it is, what does that say? What does that mean? <laughs> Not feasible, exothermic, all right? So it's about being precise, you know, when you're doing a question like this and you've got wide open spaces, you need to be really specific. So let's write this down. So delta H is negative. So reaction is uh, an exothermic one. Okay. So really important. That's one of your four marks. Okay. Is it buffering again? It's not buffering my end. So, um, right. So what else was a question? P and Q. All right, let's do Q. So Q, what does that tell us? What is Q? Good. This is the point of feasibility. I.e., uh, the temperature. Now, what we're going to say here is the temperature at which what happens. It's the temperature what at which blank. So fill in that blank. It's the temperature at which, not the temperature at which it's feasible. No. Careful. Look at the graph. We're moving from negative into positive delta G. So if I'm increasing temperature, nope, good, Miss C, we're there. So it's the temperature at which the reaction is no longer feasible, okay? So that's what we say. We always say like we're increasing temperature, okay? So it's nothing to do with entropy at this point. Okay, so P is all about delta H. Q is your point at which the, the reaction is no longer feasible. Okay, no longer feasible because we're increasing the temperature, increasing the temperature, and everything's fine and dandy here. But as soon as you get here, no, it's not going to work anymore. It's not going to be feasible because we've got a positive delta G all of a sudden. Okay, but it's at zero. That's not the temperature, though, is it? Okay. 
If it was negative correlation, yes, absolutely, Edith. So if it was a flipped question, so if it was going down the gradient, okay, from left to right, then you would write it's the temperature at which it does become feasible. Yeah. So that's really important. Now, lastly, the gradient. So the gradient, that equals minus delta S. So tell me, guys, have we got an increase or decrease in entropy for the reaction? Yes, absolutely, Edith. I would always state that gradient equals minus the delta S. Good. Therefore, um, delta S is positive and uh, the reaction has an increase in entropy, okay? Decrease in entropy. How would this graph look different if there was a bigger increase in entropy for this reaction. How would this, how would this graph look different if there was a bigger difference in entropy? Uh, sorry, is a D. Is minus delta S. Oh, gradient is minus delta S. So yeah, sorry, my bad. Thank you, Edith. Delta S is negative and it has a decrease in entropy. My bad, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The gradient is steeper, absolutely. So if there was a bigger change in delta S, it would do that, okay? So the steeper the gradient, the bigger the change in entropy because gradient equals change in entropy, okay? <laughs> yeah, I was kind of just trying my best to confuse you guys there, trying my best to confuse you guys. All right. So just be aware this graph. Okay. I mean, that's in one question, that is basically all they can do uh, in terms of asking you questions on it. Okay. That's all they can do. Um, so what next? What next? Let's do. Let's do a calculation. We all got a calculator handy. Okay, let's do this one. Six marks, guys. So this is your question. I'm going to make this as big as humanly possible. Okay, so titanium, titanium 4 chloride uh, can be made from titanium 4 oxide, as shown in the equation. So we've got the equation. We've got the delta H for it and minus 60. Um, and uh, we have got the entropy data as well. So use the equation and the data in the table to calculate the Gibbs free energy for the chain, uh, free energy change for this reaction at 989 degrees. Give your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures. Use your answer to explain whether the reaction is feasible. So I'm going to get you guys to do the calculations. So the calculation is worth five marks. I'm going to give you, I'm going to shut up. I'm not going to say anything for four minutes, starting from now.
Okay, one more minute, guys. <laughs> Edith, what's a weird number? What, what makes a number weird? Okay, lots of people getting different numbers, but I'm very pleased to see the right answer popping up on more than one occasion for you guys, okay? There is a range of answers, but it just goes to show, this is actually a fairly simple process, but there are things which can very easily go wrong as well, okay? So this for me is Delta S. Okay, so using the sum of the um, products, which is this, minus the sum of the reactants, which is this. And you do have to take into account the numbers of moles of each that you have. So I've got two carbon monoxides. I've got two carbons and I've got two chlorines in there. Okay. So what I've done here is I always tend to uh, put everything in kilojoules just because that's the way I do it. Now, once we've got that Delta S, we've got everything else we need. So I would always go uh, and state Delta H minus T Delta S. So Delta H is minus 60. That is minus, now we've got a 989 degrees Celsius. That is in Kelvin, ladies and gentlemen, 1262 multiplied by 0 0.1414, okay? So all of this is in kilojoules now, and we end up with 238 kilojoules per mole, okay? Minus 238. Um, that is also the correct number of significant figures, why? Why am I using three significant figures? Yeah, see, there's always one thing. Just one thing can throw you completely off course for these calculations. It's attention to detail, ladies and gents, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Everything else you've got is three significant figures. Even your minus 60.0 um, is, uh, is there, okay? So... Everything's in three significant figures, so that should be your answer. So why is it feasible? Well, because delta G is uh, less than zero. That's how you get your final mark on that one, okay? So yeah, the Kelvin, you gotta put your delta T, uh, you gotta put your temperature in Kelvin. You know what? It's the same when you're doing the ideal gas calculation, isn't it, okay? So PBNRT, um, it's all about the units. You gotta get your units right, okay? So these aren't, I don't think, difficult calculations. Once you've got your eye in on them, they're all right. 
but it's really easy to make simple errors and ones that go in your FFS journal. You're like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. Okay. So always Kelvin, all right? Um, so yeah, this is another, I mean, six marks. I didn't make that up. That actually was a six mark question. That's not a lot of work for six marks. But like I said, it's really easy to lose those marks by making oversights dare I say, silly errors or schoolboy errors, okay, in terms of whether it's your units, maybe you missed the number out, okay. Um, yeah, we've, I've, I've been using one for ages in FFS journal. Um, FFS stands for a frustrating fail or slip, okay, frustrating fail or slip. So it's when you look at a question and you go, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. It's just a ridiculous error that you've made. You knew better, but for some reason you had a moment of madness or a brain fart in the exam. And it's just like, oh, I'm not going to do that again. So what we recommend is you start a journal. Write down, like, if, oh, I forgot to convert the units to Kelvin when doing a delta G calculation. You read that journal. You can't revise that stuff away, all right? Because it's just a one in a hundred mistake. 99 times out of 100, you get it right. But on that one occasion, you got it wrong. Make a note in your journal, FFS. FFS can stand for other things apart from frustrating fail or slip. Um, but sometimes, you know, that's what you think when you see a question like that and you lose a mark, you're like, oh my God. Um, there we go. Edith, you're absolutely right. I'm going to show that comment because uh, YouTube hit it. You're absolutely right. Okay. But officially, it's a frustrating fail or slip. Okay. Uh, if the sig figs were different in the question, so if, if they, uh, they wouldn't do that. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, they wouldn't give you something to two sig figs and something to four sig figs and so on and so forth. But if they do, you can only be as accurate as the least number of significant figures you have for any any data that you use. So actually, if, um, uh, I don't know how to do this. I mean, they're all to three sig figs, aren't they? If you had something just to two significant figures, Okay, if there's one bit of data there, let's say that was just, um, I don't know, 52, okay, and not 52.0, then you can only be as accurate as the bit of data you have with the least number of significant figures, okay? Rich, still confused uh, on that minus 2.2, uh, 2, minus 2, 5.7. Oh, here. So it's two carbon. This is a reactant, yeah? We're taking the reactants away from the products. Carbon is 5.7. There are two of them in the equation. Same for chlorine. Uh, well, there's two ways you can write this out, okay? You can do 2198 plus 253 minus, and then if you put everything in here in brackets, 50.2 plus 2 times 5.7 uh, plus 2 times 223, that minus makes all of these minuses, doesn't it? So it really depends on how you lay your equation out. That's the only difference there, Recep. Okay. If it's less than or equal to, not less than, you lose marks in the exam. Um, it depends how the question is worded. So if the question says, um, what, what does delta G need to be in order for a reaction to be feasible? You can say zero or below. Okay, that would be your answer. So what does delta G need to be for a reaction to be feasible? Zero or below. What is it? Okay, um, use your answer to explain whether this reaction is feasible. In this, uh, in this instance, you would say it's feasible because delta G is negative, because the answer is actually negative. Okay. Uh, how would you work out delta H? Is the figures we're given still the products, my reactions? Uh, so delta H, I think if they did get you to calculate delta H, it may be that you do it using minus MC delta T. It could be that you may need to figure it out using a Hess's law energy cycle. Uh, I think in questions like this that are really focusing on en uh, sorry, uh, on entropy and Gibbs free energy, um, they tend to just give you the delta H. OK, um, so if you were ha if you had to work out a delta H, they would give you the information to do that. There's only two ways of doing it. OK, um, one is using uh, MCAT. OK, and the other is um, uh, Hess's law, using Hess's law to do it. OK, it does sound a bit like that. OK, it does sound a bit like that, Ibrahim. <laughs> 
anyone would have thought that we thought about that, but there we go. Um, cool. So, um, what other questions can we do? Do you fancy a Bourne Harbour cycle, guys? We were talking about Bourne Harbours yesterday. He was like, yeah, why not? We're here. We're here. Let's, let's, let's go crazy. Let's go crazy. So, um, da, 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 da. um, oh no, let's not do that one. Okay, let's do this one. Let's highlight this. Okay, this is a this is a typical one. Um, it looks the same. Don't forget, you have got your um, that there equals that there. Okay, so what I want you guys to do, given the data, can I get it all on screen? Can you guys see that okay if I get it all on screen like that? Yeah, you can. Okay, so three marks. In fact, how many marks is it worth? Okay, three marks, three minutes. I would like you to calculate for me, please, the lattice enthalpy of sodium oxide. So this bad boy here. Good, it's because you do lots of questions. So three minutes. can't see a eh? just make your window bigger maybe your youtube window is stopping you from doing it Now, don't forget what I said yesterday. It's just asking for the lattice enthalpy. So it's not saying lattice association or lattice dissociation. So when they say lattice enthalpy, they want the lattice association, okay? Which is this arrow going down. This is where associating the lattice. So just bear in mind when you do your calculation what the sign needs to be on your answer because it does need a sign, okay? It does need a sign. As I was doing this, are we able to go over drawing an endothermic Born Harbor cycle? I'm not entirely sure what you mean, Abraham. Lattice association, yes, Ruhab, yeah. Ah, hydration. Maybe they, uh, I don't like them, but they can do um, the hydration. So what have we got so far? Minus two one four eight, minus one nine one six, two six seven seven. Is that a plus or minus? Yeah, Nick. Minus one one nine six. Minus two five two nine minus two five two zero. Yeah, that's it, Nick. That's why I was asking. One zero eight eight.
Got another 30 seconds. <laughs> Ibrahim, I don't think it's a thing. I'll check it out, but I don't think this endothermic bone harbor cycle, never heard of it. Never heard of it. Ah, atomization of oxygen. Well, we assume it's O2, okay? Because the natural state of oxygen is O2, isn't it? Okay. And because we're using heart, we're only using one oxygen, it's half O2. So we just use that whole um, that whole one. So the answer here is minus 2520 kilojoules per mole. Okay, minus 2520 kilojoules per mole. Now the reason, okay, I'm going to highlight these as we go. This is inverted. I've inverted that arrow there to make it plus 414. 2 times 108 for the two sodiums that are being atomized. 249 for the um, atomization of oxygen. We're just using that one there. 2 times 496 for the uh, two lots of the first ionization energy of sodium. Then minus 141 is the first electron affinity of oxygen, plus 790 is the second, and we end up with minus 2520. In fact, what that does is that gives you plus 2520, but that would be this arrow, okay? Not this arrow. So when I work these out, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's not very clean and tidy, my method of working this out, but it does save um, a lot of issues, okay? So that is your actually your answer, but I would write the answer is minus 2520 because that is the lattice association of the um, sodium oxide, okay? So the if you do that, okay, you end up with a positive answer. Okay, you do end up with a positive answer. So how do we know uh, it's lattice association? Because the question states, you know, it basically just asks for what's the lattice enthalpy for sodium oxide? Okay, what's the lattice enthalpy for sodium oxide? Now, the clue is in the question. They want the transition that you see here. So this arrow going down, okay? So that's how we know it's lattice association because this arrow is here. All right. So you do have to do two times the atomization of sodium. Edith, you halve the atomization energy for oxygen. You don't have to do that. Okay. You don't have to do that. Um, if they gave you, <laughs> if they gave you bond enthalpies, yes, they do usually ask for lattice association, Miss C. Yep, yeah, you're right. CaCl3. Okay. I'll have a look. So, um, you know, you don't have to do that for uh, atomization of oxygen. You never have to halve it. Okay. So if it's a diatomic element, you don't have to halve it. Okay. That's really, really important. So, um, right. Next week. What did I say we're doing next week, guys? It's on Monday. I forgot. Um, sorry, we didn't get to hydration and solution and stuff like that. Um, but you know what? I think uh, I think that's fairly straightforward. I'll have a look at that. Um, oh, hang on, CaCl3 isn't even a thing, Ibrahim. CaCl2 is calcium chloride. CaCl3 is 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 nothing. It doesn't exist. Okay. So uh, in the schedule, I think I put in for some transition metals next week. I believe we're doing transition metals. Um, okay, acids and bases. Good. All right, let's do some acids and bases. Um, right, but CaCl3 isn't a compound. That's what I'm saying. CaCl3 is not a thing. Okay, I, I'm just, I, I just don't know what it is, mate. So I will have a look. I promise I will have a look. So um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, transition metals isn't on the schedule. Well, I, well, I know actually, I know why I didn't put it on the schedule. It's because there's so much variation in transition metals that what 
what you guys need to know between exam boards. Okay, that's why I haven't put it in there. Okay. Hey, that's all right. My pleasure. I'm so pleased to have been of some help for you guys. Okay. We're really trying to get the word out here, what we're trying to do for you uh, and for year 12s as well. Um, so if you know any year 12s, just point me in our direction. We'll help them finish the specification. We're even going to work up to doing an exam. So next week, we're doing some more with you guys. And then after that, we're going to focus on the TT method, get you doing some practice papers and stuff. We'll be doing some check-ins. We won't be live every day. We will be next week, but the week after, we won't be. Um, we won't be live every day, but we're doing some study with me. like Ronnie's been doing at four o'clock and so on and so forth. So yeah, we're going to have a break over the weekend. You guys have got access to parts of the content guide. So make sure in the examulance, you go in the top section, you see AQA, OCR, and Excel content guides. Click on one of those. Anything with a padlock on, okay, an unlocked padlock, that means in there, there are a handful of videos for you to go and watch and just help you out with, uh, with these topics, okay? So, um, yeah, I know, Miss C, I'm sorry, but the thing is, what we want you guys to do is, is to be self-motivated. And I think this is a really important point, okay? And just give me two minutes before you guys disappear off, okay? Has it been stressful? But then we're not here to stress you out, okay? I'll check that out, Ibrahim. Thank you. Um, you guys, the reason why we're doing this is to help you guys develop your independent study skills, all right? You have been spoon-fed since the moment you walked into school, okay? When you were yay high, um, all the way through to, God forbid, last Friday was your last day in sixth form, okay? Um, when you get to university, when you get to university, that changes. You are no longer... Um, saying, yes, sir, I'm here on the register or no, miss, I'm, you know, on, 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 yes, miss, I'm here on the register, okay? You are independent. You go to lectures, you go to your practicals, okay? Yeah, you'll probably get in bother if you don't go, but they don't take a register. It's on you and it's on you. They give you the bare bones in the lectures in university, broadly speaking. You, to get a first class degree, you need to go away and read around the subject and do a lot of independent learning. What we're trying to help you do over the next few weeks is develop that, is to give you a kind of framework to work to without being too prescriptive. <clears throat> you have got to manage your own time, okay? And that's what we're helping you to do over the next few weeks, okay? So yeah, we'll be live all next week because we want to review some stuff. Um, but the, the week after, we're going to do, a, a, the couple of weeks after, we're going to do a couple of past papers. I'm just going to be checking in with you guys to see how you're getting on. Um, so check the schedule. You'll see exactly what's going on. Okay. What did Agile say? Last Friday, it does, it does feel a long way away ago. And, and yes, I'm tired too, Ronnie. Absolutely right. Okay. Uh, so check out the schedule in the examulance. It's all there uh, for you guys to see. And um, yeah. I'll check in with you guys on Monday where we're going to be looking at some acids and bases. So bring your calculators. Um, we'll do some explaining and everything you need to know about acids and bases. And we'll do some questions on Tuesday on it. Okay. So uh, check the schedule. And of course, by the end of next week, we'll obviously talk a bit more about what the TT method is and how you use it and how you can apply that to uh, the past papers and stuff like that. Okay. So Thank you very much again, guys. Okay, make sure you give us all some likes. Okay, dip back into those previous videos that you've been in and uh, make sure you drop us a like if you haven't already um, and spread the word. Please spread the word. If, feel like, if you feel like this has been helpful, stick it on your social media. There's nothing to be ashamed of, okay? You're here and you're doing the right thing, okay? You're not putting your feet up, neither are we. Uh, we're going to crack on through this summer and, and, and beat this together, okay? So thank you very much. Enjoy your Friday. Enjoy your weekend. I know I am certainly going to. So you take it easy, guys, and I'll see you later.